So Garfield, I'm going to get started. People will still be filing in, but this nice. intro part, if, if they're like me, they're, they, you come in a little late so you don't hear all the housekeeping stuff. Okay. Then they're done. <laughs> so that sounds good. Sounds so like welcome everyone. Yeah. Uh, welcome everyone tonight to our February 10th meeting of the British Empire Study Group. For those of you who attend these regularly, you'll see this slide has changed. Robert Gray has moved on to, to be uh, the vice president uh, of the Collectors Club, so he doesn't really have time to be our co-chair. So if you're interested, this, there is a vacancy. I, I don't like to do this alone. So we are the British Empire Study Group, a bunch of men and women, and if you don't want to identify, you're welcome to, that have an interest in British, the British Empire and British philately or anything related. We're very loose on that definition. So we enjoy both the social aspect and we like to learn and do presentations. So it's pretty fun. We generally meet in Midtown Manhattan. So uh, usually at the Collectors Club, but uh, you know, we'll, it's been a little dormant now and in webinars like this one. So again, I said we're very loose with the term British Empire. So British Empire is very, very broad. And if it, if we flew over it, if we once owned it, or if we just had a post office in it or walked through it, it's fair game for the British Empire Study Group. Our next meeting is on March 10th at six o'clock, and that will be on the British Guiana, which is the world's. Everyone knows the British Guiana, but do you really know the British Guiana? Well, you'll find out from Robert Scott. And then I have a picture of Fonce's Tavern here, uh, just because that's coming up in April, and you'll see it before and after. So for housekeeping, uh, just a couple quick, you'll see uh, you should put your questions in the Q&A or in the chat function. We'll read that. Following the presentation, there is a social, and we'll bring everyone over from the webinar format into more of a meeting format. If you find those little closed captions annoying, on the right-hand side, you'll see subtitles. Just click on that and say, disable the subtitles, and you will not see them. If you're interested in the topic or interested in speaking, please shoot me a note. So our website is a British Empire BE, it doesn't have to be capitalized, studygroup.org. So tonight we have the infamous, and I say infamous because he works for the Green Foundation, uh, Garfield Porsche, and he's going to talk to us about the early history of the Toronto Post Office and a little bit about CAPEX because, I mean, that's coming up and it's, it's going to be such a fabulous event, uh, as is London. I mean, London which is going to be very nice. I wish COVID didn't step on it, but COVID should not be a factor at Capex and anyone who's interested in, in, in philately should be there. It's gonna be, be happening. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about Garfield. I, I don't send out his bio or put it on the, the website. I think it's only on Eventbrite, but Garfield is, is one of those icons in philately. He's been collecting stamps since the 70s. And he is part of the Vinnie Green Foundation, which expertizes stamps. So he has that connection to that analytical philately, which is something that's really dear to me. He operates the West Toronto Stamp Club. They have talks similar to this. They're really fun. Uh, shoot him a note. He might invite you if you're nice to him. But he's done a lot of things. He's on the board of directors of the expert committee, and he's a fellow of the Royal Philatelic Society of Canada, another great group. So without further ado, because you're not here to listen to me, I am going to turn it over to Garfield. Thanks, Joan. And not that terribly infamous. Uh, yeah, I do hang around the Green Foundation a lot. Uh, great sport, but thank you for the wonderful introduction. And thanks to all the people who have been putting up the little personal notes there. Uh, I appreciate your encouragement and I'll try not to let you down tonight. 
And I noticed somebody from Argentina mentioned that the weather is nice and warm down there. Uh, here in Toronto, it's the temperatures are nice, even zero as we speak. Uh, heading down for minus 18 tonight, I think it said on the weather report. So uh, Argentina, you can send your heat up here and we'll send some snow down to you. Garfield, uh, I did forget to mention that you said you wanted questions, that you wanted to take some questions during the talk. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to field questions as people, uh, as we go along. Don't, uh, don't feel badly about interrupting. Um, so, so just raise your hand and what I'll do is I'll unmute you and you could ask Garfield a question as you're going on. So you don't have to hold it till the end. Sounds good, Joan. Hey, um, before I started, uh, Joan asked me to say a few words about CAPEX 22, which is upcoming. And uh, I'd like to encourage everybody that's uh, online with us tonight to make a point of, uh, of joining us up here in Toronto. Uh, June in Toronto is a whole lot nicer than February in Toronto. Uh, the weather is warm. You probably won't need a coat or boots. Um, it, it's, just, it's just the beginning of the summer here. So I say it's, it's really lovely. Um, this stamp show is going to be a real burn burner. Uh, I'm not on the committee, but I know a lot of people, uh, members of my board of directors at the Green, who are on the committee. Uh, David McLaughlin has been working diligently for five years to, to get this set up. And uh, people like Ingo Nessel and Bill Longley and Joe Trousey have just been really busting their tails to make this thing a go. Um, it's going to be at the Metro Toronto Convention Center, which is right in the heart of downtown Toronto. Um, yeah, and just a baseball's throw from uh, where the Blue Jays play. Uh, if the if the season's underway, then I presume it will be. But I'm not a baseball fan. Uh, the Metro Toronto Convention Center. We got twenty eight thousand square feet, which is going to house eighty five plus dealer booths and uh, and uh, other representative booths. I understand there's four hundred and eleven single frame exhibits that are. That have been accepted for the show um, and just an incredible number i don't think there's ever been 411 single frame exhibits put together in one place in history so it, it should be a, a whole lot of fun uh evening events are lined up for just about every evening i understand that banaps has a big shindig up for the thursday night i have no idea what it's going to be but i've been told that i cannot miss it and i cannot schedule anything else that night uh, friday night is going to be uh, an auction uh, the marish auction is going to sell the uh, international gold medal exhibit of uh, fred fawn's large queens so that should be a, a very well attended event and as I say, I have no idea what the other events are. I think you'll see a social calendar published very, very shortly. And the, uh, the registration went online live today. And uh, the registration fee is going to be $15 per day or $50 for the four-day ticket event. And uh, anyone under 16 will be admitted free as long as they're accompanied by an adult who obviously buys a ticket. Uh, so it's going to be a great event, very well worth your while attending. Uh, good arrangements are made for very nearby hotels. The Intercontinental is attached to the Metro Convention Center, and that's one of the participating hotels in the, uh, in the rate structure. I understand that one of the hotels is oversubscribed, but they're just, they're opening it up and letting us go even further at the, at the same rate. So Get, get the word in quickly. If you're coming up, get your room booked soon because I think that they're going to fill up very quickly. Uh, anything else that we need to know on that one, Joan, or should we let the questions kind of trickle through as they might? Let, let them digest it. And once they hear about the Toronto Post Office, I think that will get them kicking also. Okay, terrific. And the Toronto Post Office is someplace you can go to visit when, they, when the show's on too. Uh, they certainly will be open. So the, Toronto's first post office, well, there, there's the plan of the town of York back in, back in 1897. And as you can see, it's just a, a very small, small community. Uh, 
accomplishments about 10 blocks today and maybe even four blocks deep and to put it in perspective this is the this is the Don River here if you're looking at maps of Toronto uh, the Don River has uh, been around for a long time but it's kind of detours through the harbor now and uh, it's been cut off down at this point uh, the Toronto Islands are down in the the bottom left corner of your screen and and off the map um, so anyhow, it's, it's a small community, it's mosquito laden, you know, lots of bugs in the day and uh, kind of inhospitable, inhospitable at the time. It was really a swamp, a muddy swamp. The uh, Lieutenant General John Graves Simcoe was the, if you will, the, the founder. He was, he was the guy that came over from uh, Newark or uh, Niagara on the lake to establish the, the new uh, community. And the reason they wanted to move it from Niagara on the lake to this new location uh, was because Toronto was not quite as accessible to invasion by the Americans. Uh, apologies to our American friends, but uh, they, they, they feared the Americans hitting the, uh, the capital, which they ultimately did in 1812, but that's another story. So there are a couple of significant dates in the history of Toronto. Uh, 1793, Simcoe got here. Later in 1793, he renamed the whole in the, in the, in the territory York. Now the population was only 241 with 97 females and obviously the rest being males. Um, York was then appointed the capital of Upper Canada as said, having moved it from uh, Niagara on the Lake, and William Wilcox became the first postmaster in York. Uh, in a couple of years' time, uh, there was a regular service requested between York and Niagara, uh, but I think it was a pretty informal service at the time. And in 1800, there was a, a service between Montreal and York. Uh, again, it wasn't a regular mail, and it was about six weeks of delivery time. Uh, and there really wasn't that much going on in the Toronto Post Office, in the York Post Office at the time. 1801, William Wilcox resigned in favor of William Allen, then Donald McLean, and then William Allen took over the job again in 1908. There's very little postal history available from that time period, and that which there is is disgustingly expensive and uh, pretty much in, in the archives. So there's old William Wilcox, uh, looks like a crusty old uh, Irishman, uh, probably was. And uh, anyhow, he, he was out of the post office picture in, in 18, 1801. This is a piece of, of mail that I can only wish that I had in my collection. Uh, it was out of the Alan Steinhardt collection and uh, Pretty much the earliest known mail out of uh, out of York in February of 1798, and uh, carried it as as a favor letter, and uh, of course rated collect. We didn't have any any postage facilities here. So William Allen was our our second postmaster, and uh, William Allen, I guess his big claim to watch this thing for the family compact. The family compact played a a huge part in the development of the city of Toronto and, the, and, and in the development of York as well. But it was a, a combination of, uh, of, the, of the legal people and the church people and the, uh, and the political uh, hoi polloi who tried to control everything and they were uh, pretty strong right wingers. And there's the earliest postmark I've ever seen out of York. And this one belongs to Kimmel Salonen. Uh, who also has a pretty decent collection of, uh, of York and Toronto material. So it's the straight line York dated March the 20th, 1803. It's on a single folded letter. And it's just a, an absolutely gorgeous strike. Um, Kimmo and I have taken all of our combined York postmarks and played with them on the VSC 6000. And we think that from the time that the machine was invented until it was scrapped, they only had one York hammer. Uh, we've you know, done the superimpositions and so on. And while bits and pieces are missing, it appears to still be the one hammer all the way through. So uh, there, aren't, there isn't too much variety in that period of time. 
Garfield, where did that one go from? Two. Two. Where did it go to? This one, I, I, you know what? I haven't got the foggiest idea because Kimmo sent me the picture and he only sent me the back of it. So I, I don't. On the other I, side. I have, I have no idea where the other side went to. Thank you. Both sides, both sides went to the same place. I just don't know where it was addressed to. Um, the first post office didn't get opened until 1815, and it was right down the street from what is now as still operating as Toronto's first post office, but it was on the uh, on the east side of Frederick between King and Front Streets, and uh, that building was demolished many many years ago. So. All that's left is this you know, kind of a junky little postcard. Here's a, a letter that uh, shows a straight line marking from Brockville coming into York. And it's the, it's the earliest piece in my collection that has anything to do with York. Um, so it's essentially it's a, just a, a very standard letter uh, traveling a little over 200 miles and rated 10 pence sterling or 11 pence currency. And one of the things that you've got to remember when you're playing with the Canadian postal history is that we had the two currencies. The sterling was the British currency and the, and the, the currency pence was the called Halifax currency. Uh, why they were had two different, I guess it was like you know, two different dollars, who knows, but anyhow, the, uh, the, the British sterling was more valuable than Canadian currency. So the, the rating sometimes gets confusing because all of the books rate things in sterling, but the postal markings are all in currency. So now we come to James Scott Howard, York's fourth postmaster. And uh, when, when he arrived from, uh, from Ireland, uh, he came via Fredericton, moved to York in 1819, and uh, he began working for William Allen uh, in various and sundry uh, projects as a customs collector, treasurer, postmaster, and so on. And in 1828, he became the postmaster of York. Uh, Howard, I think, was kind of a brilliant guy. He was a read of the politics. Uh, he considered that the job of being a postmaster was a, an extremely responsible position. And... Uh, he really dedicated himself to doing the job, and I, I hold him in high esteem from all that's written. Uh, this is the office that he inherited. It's on the south side of Adelaide between Jarvis and George Streets, and again, very close again to what is now Toronto's first post office or York's fourth post office. And by the way, at any get there, all of these post offices in York, there was never two of them running at the same time. There was only at, at any given time, there was one post office in either York or Toronto until 1881. Um, here, here we are in 1828. This is my York straight line. And you'll see that the, the, the date line has actually broken off and it was done in manuscript, but that is still the same uh, hammer that was shown on, on Kimmo's cover from, uh, from 1803. So I, I think that that, uh, that uh, straight line hammer really paid for itself getting you know, a minimum of 25 years of service. Uh, good value for the money. And this letter, of course, was free. It was being sent off to, to Queenston, to Mr. Hamilton, who was the postmaster. And of course, being the postmaster, he was entitled to uh, mail free of uh, any franking. This is an early incoming letter uh, to uh, Major General Sir John Colburn. Uh, Colburn was a major player in, in the uh, Upper Canada as he was made Lieutenant Governor, appointed in August 1828. And this letter arrived to him in November of 1828. And the rating here, as I say, was uh, very interesting as it starts off in sterling. So it was rated two shillings and tuppence from uh, London to Halifax via a packet. Uh, then that's converted to two and five in here. And plus a shilling and eight pence from Halifax to Quebec and one and six for forwarding from Quebec to Toronto. 
So a total of five shillings and uh, seven pence to be paid at Toronto. That was a heck of a lot of money. And what that was was a letter stating that uh, 200 pounds had been credited in his account for running the, the government in Upper Canada, and that another 200 pounds would be made available um, in the fall, in the June of uh, 1829. So now we get York's third post office, another kind of a rickety structure, but uh, again on George Street, south of Adelaide, and the building was demolished. Uh, and again, this is the only record that I've ever seen of that of that office. Uh, part of a series of postcards was done for one of the capexes in the in the last century. There is a, a I think our first circular date stamp in in York, and uh, it, so it's a double double ring stamp with the uh, sorry with with the date uh, in the uh, in the center. So York and UC for Upper Canada in the uh, in between the two rings. This is one of the most extraordinary pieces I think I've ever seen. Uh, you know, we uh, as postal historians we look for early dates and late dates, and this is a piece that uh, my friend Kim O'Sullivan found in Kingston uh, on a trip last fall, and this letter has been postmarked with the York Upper Canada circle that I just showed you, but it's also been overprinted with the replacing hammer, which is this puppy. So the two of them are laid one over top of the other on April the 29th of, of 1830. And uh, I, I used the VSC 6000 to create a subtractive image showing that uh, you know the, the, the two of them are in fact in place. There's two completely separate devices. So we think that this is the last day that this device was used and the first day that this device was used. And that was kind of a bittersweet decision for me, uh, but I think it's an extraordinary piece. And the thing that upset me was that I had this piece in my collection, which until the discovery of that one was, this was the earliest known use of the York Upper Canada uh, hand stamp. And it's uh, you know, a, a very nice strike. Um, and one of the things about this particular device is that there's no year in it, but because uh, all the mail in those days was folded letters, at least you've got the date on the it's the year on the uh, the letter on the inside. Um, so here's your letter rated nine nine pence currency for a single letter traveling 101 to 200 miles, which is uh, York to London, Ontario. Now, in 1833, the population of York was up to 9,000, but the postmaster, by his contract, was responsible for creating the premises and hiring and paying the clerks and purchasing supplies. So he, he had to do the, not just running the post office, he had to run the post office. Uh, so in uh, 1833, Howard entered negotiations with the Bank of Upper Canada, uh, William Allen, the aforementioned, who was president, and he bought a piece of property on Duke Street, immediately adjacent to the bank. And it was a wooded property. And uh, so there's the, there's the bank and, and the property right next is one behind this tree. And Howard built this very striking post office. Uh, the facility was uh, uh, supposed to be something that was uh, strong and dignified and durable. So uh, Howard built it with this end being the post office. This is the entry to the post office and the office occupies about this space in here. And the rest became his personal residence. Uh, it's a beautiful building. And this is the building that is still in place today and still operating as uh, Toronto's first post office. Uh, it has served several purposes in between and so the biscuit manufacturing plant and other things, but the Historical Society bought it. And there's what's restored to today. It's a, a, just a beautiful building. And uh, when you come to Capex, it's a place you've got to go and visit. Here's a letter going out of, uh, again, out of York using the York Upper Canada hand stamp and a free letter to Mr. Walsh, who was the postmaster in Victoria, 
you'll see lots of mail going to Victoria because that was the financial center of Upper Canada, um, well away from uh, any potential invasion from the Americans, but they had not moved it to uh, the, the tax center to Toronto yet or to York yet. So you'll see a lots of mail going to Victoria and a lot of it either dressed to Walsh or to the treasurer down there. So on March the 6th, 1834, Toronto became York, was incorporated as the city of Toronto, and York's fourth post office became Toronto's first post office. And Howard was the, the postmaster immediately, of course, and he was able to hold on to that job until 1837 when he unfortunately got fired. Uh, but when he took over, the uh, Toronto population was 9,256. There was mail twice a week between Toronto and Kingston with 22 stops en route. And uh, by the time he was fired, the mail was arriving and leaving Toronto six days a week. It was very expensive to mail letters in those days. Uh, and we see the four and a half pence as being the standard uh, letter rate. And uh, as you can see below, milk was three and a half pence a quart and eggs three pence a dozen. So the, the cost of sending a letter was, was fairly substantial. And it was, it was approaching a day's pay for a, a laborer. Garfield, quick question. Yes. Toronto, Toronto, What? where did they get that name? Do you know? Uh, yes, yeah, so this, that's a long story in itself. It was an, uh, a purchase of, of land from seven Indian nations. I don't know if we're supposed to say Indians anymore, um, but uh, there was a purchase of the land from, from several Indians, including the Mississaugans and the Iroquois, and Toronto was a, a, a bastardization of, their, of one of the native names. I'd have to get at the exact details. That could be a story for another day. <laughs> Thank you. So again, another letter going out to uh, to Victoria, but this is in May of 1834. York is gone, Toronto is in, but the new hand stamp hasn't arrived yet. So they're still using the, the old device. And by the way, there's an interesting story about the red markings. Uh, Howard liked the red markings that they were using in Montreal. So he wrote to the Postmaster General to get permission to use the red instead of the standard black markings. So, Black stamp pads were issued, but uh, they said, well, if you want to use the red, you can, you can do it. Uh, so that permission was given to, to him as a personal favor by the Postmaster General. So stuff that went out of the Toronto and the York Post Office in Howard's time period is marked in red. Um, this is hardly shows here, but it's it really is here. You've you got to believe me. Just take my word. Um, but the, the York hand stamp carried on. And July 4th, 1834 is the latest piece that I have seen with it. Uh, this is rated one penny as a, as a drop letter. And this, this too is out of Kimo Salona's collection. I snitched it because of, of the late date of the York hand stamp. Now comes the, the new City of Toronto hand stamp, which is a, a, a great huge device, double ring uh, with, with the date in the middle. And uh, again, an, another free letter to the postmaster at, at Queenston. Uh, but the earliest date of use of this uh, hand stamp was September the 5th of 1834. This is November the 13th. So it's, it's reasonably early, but uh, certainly not the earliest. There, there are earlier covers known. One of the other main characters in Toronto at the time was a gentleman named Ryerson. Uh, he seems to have been socially disgraced lately on political terms, and they've taken his name off the university that he uh, was named after him. And uh, I'm just not sure what is going to happen there, but uh, it seems that he was somehow or another allied with slavery in, uh, in his time period. So it's not politically correct. But he was also the chief superintendent for education in Upper Canada, and he was a, a Methodist minister and a, a very active man in the, in the political scene and the religious scene in Toronto uh, at the time. And there is a letter to Edgerton Ryerson, 
uh, in his capacity as the editor of the Christian Herald uh, in Upper Canada. And that came in on the uh, date of January 13th, 1835 from London to Toronto and you can see via Liverpool. It's, uh, I, I love these messy covers. I think they're really quite exciting. Uh, in 1835, Howard moved his family out of the post office uh, up to a place near Young and St. Clair, not too far from where the Green Foundation sits, sits today. And the additional space at Duke Street became part of the post office operations. Uh, he had a staff of six. And Howard in, in, uh, was offered the position of post office surveyor of Upper Canada. Now, the surveyor was the guy who was really the supervisor of all postal facilities. And he declined the job, and the position was given to Charles Bertsey, uh, who was the postmaster at Amherstburg. Uh, Bertsey was a bit of a character who's, uh, you know, on, on my scale of one to ten as being great guys, rates about a zero. Uh, I, I just don't think much of Bertsey, but he was in pretty good with the family compact, and he was also tied in very nicely with Mr. Bond Head, who was the Lieutenant Governor of Upper Canada. You got to remember that story for later on. So here's a, a City of Toronto letter from uh, the Canada Company going to the Canada Company in England. And this one's a, a very interesting cover in as much as it's got the rating again in three different currencies. You can see up here there's three and one, which has been prepaid, a dollar twenty-five, which is prepaid, and six and eight, which is collect. And I, I spent ages trying to figure out these rates until I finally called Bill Longley and I said, Bill, please help me. Uh, you know, what the heck's going on with this thing? And the key is this number up here, which is the one and a quarter ounce, which is a five times rate. Uh, so here's the explanation of the rating now. So being a quintuple rate, the rate from Toronto, to, and by it's going from Toronto to London, England. So it's going to go via New York. So the rate from Toronto to Queenston, where it's going to cross into the States, by land is seven pence, five times, five times rated, takes it to 35 pence, Two pence ferriage across the Niagara River is 37p, uh, which translates to thir three and one in currency, which is prepaid. From Lewiston to New York is 25 cents times the five times rating is the dollar and a quarter, which is prepaid. And then this is the part that confused me, but at Portsmouth, and we know it came into Portsmouth because of this marking here, uh, it's an incoming letter fee of eight pence, which is a huge number, but being a quintuple letter, that becomes the 40 pence. And then the postage from Portsmouth to London also is 40 pence, which comes to 80 pence, which is six shillings and eight pence sterling. So again, a ton of money to get a letter from Toronto to London. And it took 38 days, which is about the same as it takes today. Uh, enter William Lyon Mackenzie. Uh, Mackenzie was, an, I think, one of the most interesting rabble-rousers I've, uh, I've run across. Uh, born in 1795, he was a real political agitator and stirred the pot. He became the first mayor of Toronto. Uh, he was continuously fighting with the family compact. Uh, he was continuously in, in opposition to uh, Lieutenant Governor Bond Head. Whoops. What happened there? And he was also the guy that got the rebellion going in December of 1837. Uh, we won't go too much into that story because it's a, it's a long build-up story. We also have this guy, Sir Francis Bond Head. And I say he was the accidental Lieutenant Governor. His brother was supposed to get the job, but somebody over in England screwed up and sent him instead. Uh, and so he and, he, he, he and Mackenzie just never really Quietly, he's got it on together. But he was quietly opposed to Howard, who, as I mentioned before, would not get involved in the politics. Uh, Howard just completely stayed right out of everything. Uh, so Bondhead is the one that appointed Bertsey as the post office surve surveyor, 
with instructions to spy on Howard. He wanted to build a case against Howard, and of course the rebellion was brewing in Toronto, and mail was being sent through the Toronto Post Office. Uh, so uh, Bertsy, in his capacity as post office surveyor, uh, broke the law, but he was opening the mail to read it and see what seditious stuff was going through. And they finally ended up, uh, when all was said and done after the rebellion, uh, said that uh, Howard supported the rebels, and as a postmaster, he shouldn't have done that, so they fired him. So the rebellion went on, on in uh, on December of 7th of 1837. You know, Howard's staying neutral. Bertsy's now in the post office as a spy. The rebellion goes on December the 7th, and on December the 13th, Howard was fired. And uh, and that's a, another lovely story of, of his lawsuit and his attempts to prove that he was innocent. But in 1838, lo and behold, Bertsy gets appointed the postmaster of Toronto. And of course, he inherits or moves into the, the building that Howard built, and as you remember, he still owns it. So there's a quick rundown of the family compact, guys. As you can see, there. I mean, there's John Robinson. He's in the law business. Bishop Strawn. He's in the religion business. William Osgood and, and Jonas uh, Jones, lawyers, bankers. I mean, these are pretty powerful people, and and these are the ones that Howard and Mackenzie were taking on at the time. So here's one of the best letters I found in my collection so far. Uh, right after the rebellion, this is, this is January the 13th, 1838, so the rebellion is just over. Toronto's the capital of Upper Canada, and Member of Parliament John Fowler is writing a letter to his home constituency in Ottawa. Uh, of course, it was only it was called Bytown then. So he's writing to the editor of the Bytown Gazette. And he starts off, Mackenzie's in prison in the USA. Rebels are scattered from Navy Island and Bondhead is to be replaced. And there's all kinds of political inside stuff in, in this lovely short letter. Uh, Navy Island, for those that don't know, is the, uh, almost a little rock in the Niagara River above the falls. Uh, but the, they mentioned this guy, General Van Renessler or I'm not sure how that pronunciation is. Joan, do you know how you pronounce that guy's name? There's a couple of towns in New York with his name as well. Uh, I'll butcher it. Rensselaer or something like that. What? Rensselaer? Rensselaer. 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 Rensselaer? Okay. Yeah. Well, anyhow, he comes from an interesting family because uh, there were there were billionaires already. And, and we're talking, you know, 1837, and the guy's a billionaire. Um, but uh, his, his daddy was uh, the general that led the charge against the... Uh, against General Brock at Queenston Heights when, when Brock was killed. So they were very much involved in the War of 1812. Uh, but having just come off the American Revolution and being four generations of military in, in New York, uh, they were very much against the monarchy and were quite willing to support the rebels. So uh, the young general uh, got hooked up with Mackenzie and Mackenzie had taken all of his rebels, and they were stashed down on this island, about 800 strong. And uh, they, you know, they, they got hold of a boat called the Carolyn, a steamship, which they ran up and down the Niagara River on the American side, uh, raising supplies and money and food and munitions. But they made one mistake, and uh, that is that because uh, Renesler had the, uh, the keys to the arsenal, they also stole guns and munitions and set up a, a military base on Navy Island, which they declared to be the Republic of Canada with Mackenzie as the president. And when they were testing one of the guns, they lobbed a shot into an American military base. Uh, so they were both arrested for breaking the peace and for uh, in, install, in, instilling uh, riots and uh, revolution. And uh, so that's why Mackenzie was in jail. The uh, when the Brits finally came to roust the rebels out of Navy Island, uh, they fired a couple of shots on the on the Carolyn, which was the ship, killing one American crewman, and then they put the ship over the over the Niagara Falls, 
And uh, if you check the law books today, there's uh, still quite an interesting law on the statutes uh, that you're allowed to take preemptive action if you think that that asset, namely the ship, is going to have a detrimental effect against your home country. Apparently that's been part of the, uh, the tactics that have been used in the Middle East by various forces as well. That's another story. But I'd say it's a fascinating letter and that letter has led to a, a pile of research about one inch thick in my file. But uh, it also mentions that uh, uh, Bondhead was going to get fired, which he did. And he was replaced by a guy named uh, Sir George Arthur. And nobody's heard about him because he wasn't a very nice guy, but he was the, uh, the chief custodian and uh, director of Van Diemen's Land, which was the prison camp outside of Australia. And he was an ethnic cleanser. Um, in his six months as the governor of that jail, he managed to hang some 260 blacks uh, and just left their bodies hanging as a, as a message to everybody else that it wasn't nice to mess with him. Uh, his first duty when he came back to, when he came to Canada and got appointed, was he hanged two of the rebels that were involved in the, in, in the rebellion. So he, he carried on the job and uh, I say he wasn't a nice guy. He didn't last very long here either. He got recalled to England and uh, posted to some other place that nobody knew about or cared about. So anyhow, when uh, Howard launched an appeal to reverse his dismissal, the appeal was denied. Howard said to uh, Birdsey, get your post office out of my building. So he had to go find a new post office. He built one at Young and Front Street. Then Howard rented the vacant spaces to a dance uh, studio. And in 1841, it was sold to a hardware merchant uh, who converted it back to a private residence. And that's the end of the Toronto's first post office until the 1960s when it was uh, reinstated as post office. So here we are in uh, March of 1838. And you know, so now that Howard is gone, um, you know, we've got the late use of the Toronto hand stamp, but the use of the red expired with Howard's dismissal, and they had to go back, had to go to using black ink. So now we got Bertsey as the postmaster. There he is. Uh, he, he ran a, a spy ring on behalf of the government. He was also director of the Bank of Upper Canada. He was the president of Consumers Gas. But the postmaster general in his report said that uh, he never really distinguished himself. There was the thing. There was the thing that he really did a nice job of. He he built a brand new post office at uh, Young and Front Street, really a, a lovely building uh, for the time. By the 1840s, the population of Trout is up to 21,000. We got a letter carrier now, and uh, you know the red and black was used for prepaid and, and unpaid mail. So here's the use of the Trout hand stamp in in black. Uh, but it's also now you see the introduction of the too late hand stamp. This is kind of an interesting uh, cover your backside thing. The postmasters were penalized if the mail was delayed. So here's a letter going to Kingston, uh, but it was uh, after the, the mailbag was closed is when it was posted. So they stamped it too late so they didn't get blamed for delaying the mail. It went out in the next bag. But So anything that came into the post office after the mailbag was sealed, was stamped too late. There's a piece of steamboat mail coming into Toronto, and uh, this would have come from Niagara on the Lake or, or Newark, uh, whichever. And there, there was a steamboat that came across on, on a daily basis. And for the convenience of, of people sending mail out on that, they had a box on the boat, but you couldn't buy postage. So uh, anything that came across was received at the city of Toronto and then marked postage due. Uh, so it was uh, four and a half pence collect. And uh, the reason it was four and a half pence because the, the rate was for a letter going less than 60 miles. Had it gone by coach around the end of the lake, it would have been 70 miles. So the rate would have been seven pence. So it was cheaper to mail it 
collect across the lake than, than it was to uh, let it go around the end. And it's got, a, a, as you can see, the, the steamboat letter marking is there. And it likely came across on a boat called the Transit. Uh, June 1841, this is kind of my forerunner of, of registered mail coming in and out, going out of Toronto. And you can see that uh, they called it a money letter at the time rather than registered mail. And you can see this one's got lots of good characteristics. It's marked cash up here in the corner, so we know it's a money letter. It was also received too late going to Kingston. Um, and it's rated one in six currency. And the rate to, for a single letter to Kingston would have been nine pence. So with the letter and so the, the money enclosed, picked up another rate. So it's a double rated uh, letter, uh, taking it to one in six currency. Here's another method of marking the, the too late. Uh, this letter was posted on the, the 18th of December, uh, but the train going to Guelph was a twice a week service. And uh, it was sent out on the 22nd. So they marked that the 18th received the 22nd sent out. And uh, th those dates do check out nicely. Thank you. Uh, th this is a, an interesting letter that's a, it's a huge broadsheet. It's about the size of a, uh, of a double newspaper page. But right across, and it's very fragile. I'm, I'm afraid to unfold it. I want to get the thing uh, uh, repaired or uh, reconstituted by a paper uh, reconstructionist. But right across the center of the third page of the letter, it says Mackenzie has got liberated from jail. He's not only got his liberation, but like with a pardon from the United States and is running at large. Uh, so we know that he's, he's back in Toronto in, in 1840. And uh, in fact, he came back with, with a vengeance and got reelected as, uh, as a provincial uh, representative. So an interesting character keeps on showing up. Here's another letter going back to the earlier mentioned Canada Company. Uh, Canada Company was just a, a, a large land gathering operation located on Frederick Street, so right across from the post office. But they, they acquired huge tracts of land in Huron County and then went back to England and tried to encourage uh, immigrants to come to Canada, and they doled out the land to them as, uh, as settlers' rights. Here's a, a, a cross-border a cross letter, and we're getting in now into the split ring hand stamps as well. So this is a nice double split ring. Uh, split rings are an interesting study, and uh, it's a rabbit hole that uh, you can go down in, in Toronto history, and you can spend a lot of time. Uh, I've identified 39 single split rings, and uh, I'm not sure how many doubles, but uh, it, it's an interesting rabbit hole. So there's the there's the new the new hammer. Uh, you'll notice it's dropped the city of from it. Just it's just Toronto, and it's Toronto Upper Canada, but it's it's paid to the line. So a lot of mail was prepaid to New York, and then from uh, from Lewiston on, uh, it was collect. Here's mail is, is redirected. It just comes into Toronto. But it's uh, going up to York Mills, which is the, the very north end of Toronto, up near the Highway 401 now, if, uh, if you're familiar with Toronto geography. So it's arrived at Toronto, uh, all prepaid. But now you see they've added another uh, two and a half pence for onward transmission. And there's your forwarded hand stamp. And there's your, there's your two and a two and a half more to pay. Garfield, did that go cross country? I mean, to get to, to get to Halifax. Well, it, it, it would have come across on a, on a steamer, probably into uh, into New York in a closed bag, or sorry, into Halifax in a closed bag. Okay. And then by so then by, it would be by partly by coach because the, the trains weren't through to Toronto until eighteen fifty nine. <clears throat> so it would have been Thank you. probably to probably to Montreal by by rail. And then uh, from uh, from Montreal into Toronto, probably by by coach. Montreal. 
in, in January of 1844, the, uh, the, the rate calculations changed and they got rid of the number of sheets as the, as the basis for the rates and they worked, started working on, on weight. So your basic single rate was a letter not over a half ounce. And then from a half to one ounce, it was two rates. Under two ounce, four rates, and up to three ounces, six rates. There's a very handsome post office, which became Toronto's third post office. And uh, that building just doesn't exist anymore, but it looks like a fairly handsome little place. And uh, this is the only picture I've ever seen of it. And it's in the, the John Ross Robertson Library. And it didn't really play a significant part in, in Toronto postal history, other than that's where the post office was. And this is the introduction of a, of a new two late hand stamp. And now we're into the, the italic hand stamps rather than the uh, uppercase uh, lettering. Another, uh, another money letter. Um, and you notice know, instead of putting cash on it, now they're marking it money. It seems that everything going to Montreal was, was marked too late. I, I have no idea why. Um, except that, you know, perhaps people waited till the end of the day to mail their letters. And I think the mailbags for Montreal were probably sealed late in the afternoon. And many businesses in Toronto stayed open till 6 or 6.30 in the evening. So they, if they dropped off the mail on the, on the way home for dinner, they were too late for that day's mail. That's only a theory. I can't prove it, but it's, a, it's what you call a guess. Um, here's another new um, double ring hand stamp for Toronto. And then now it says Toronto.Canada. And again, nothing spectacular about the letter, except that it's a, a, a new hand stamp. And this is in 1850. And um, now we got the Toronto Canada with the introduction of the three pence hand stamp. So instead of scribbling it in, in the manuscript, now they've got a, a stamp to do it. And you know, the volume of mail is building up in the city. So it, it's made sense to uh, have that repetitive marking made into a permanent hand stamp. And then they added the word paid. Excuse me, but they also put paid into the uh, into the base of the, the hand stamp as well. So they're, again, red markings because they were prepaid. Now there's from the 1852 report of the Postmaster General. And you'll notice now that we've got seven clerks in the, in the, in the post office. We've got Bertsey as the postmaster making 400 pounds a year. Whoops. Now we got, a letter carrier making 30 pounds a year and a clerk making 25 pounds a year. So money went a long ways. And Bertsey's uh, course came to an end fairly quickly and he had all these crazy jobs going. And I guess the, he did the, the country a favor by uh, he committed suicide on June the 9th, 1858. Uh, so having never distinguished himself in any of the jobs and being a bit of a smarmy character, I figure at the best of times, uh, that was the end of him. So in comes Joseph Leslie, and Joseph Leslie is a real professional postmaster. And uh, he built this new post office uh, at the corner of King and uh, Victoria Street, or Toronto Street. Beautiful, beautiful building. It still stands today and it's being used as an investment banker's uh, building. But it was an absolutely lovely looking building. And uh, so you, when, you, and when you're in for Capex, you can go and visit. You have a hell of a time getting inside, but you can, you can look at it from the outside and it looks exactly the same as this. It's really a lovely structure. And there's Joseph Leslie, the, the third postmaster. And lo and behold, guess who he's tied in with? William McKenzie. And he got the job, of course, was his dad was the postmaster in Dundas, Ontario. So it was a political appointment, but he, he did a pretty good job. And during his time period, the mail service on rail was introduced. Street mailboxes were added. 
Of course, he didn't do this. They switched to decimal currency in 1859. But he did provide the letter carriers with cash so they could ride on the on the streetcars while they're doing delivery and pickup of mail. And in 1875, we had the free mail delivery decreed in 11 cities in, in, in Canada, Toronto being one of them. So here's the, uh, again, the use of the, the Toronto hand stamp with the paid at the base and the, and the paid three pence. So they're still well in, in uh, you know, well in use into the 1851. Uh, Another modification with the paid gone, but the still got the three pence paid in 1852. Now we get into the fancy numerals, and these are these are really quite attractive. They did have these uh, cut for other other rates as well, but uh, you just don't see them all that often. But you notice instead of having Toronto Canada, it's now Toronto Upper Canada, and no periods in the, between the U and C. Because um, one of the other devices does have periods in there, which are how you sort them out. There's a nice early use of the of the seven ring obliterator. Uh, we're into now into the stamped period. Uh, as that became effective in April of 1851. Of course, that had nothing to do with Toronto postal history. That's just Canada postal history. Now we're into another new date stamp. And this is, this is a, one of the a honk and big thing and, and as a black circular item. There, again, there's no year in here. So you either need a receiving mark on the other side or you need contents. And, or if you're lucky, you've, you've got the letter on the other side to, to prove the, the year of the, uh, of the use of the device. Another new hand stamp also in red and with, with paid incorporated into the into the solid ring. But now they make no, no bones, but it's paid three, no question whatsoever. 1856 in October, guess what? We've now got the rail line completed between Toronto and Montreal. And uh, this opens up a, a whole new set of, of postal history, which is really fun to study. And I'm not going to go into the rail business, but because it, it's just a it's a great story and it's a story for another day. But that is the only known photograph of the Toronto's first Union Railway station, not a very imposing structure. And that's what the mail train looked like in, in those days. You know, just the engine, the tender, the mail car, and one passenger coach. And uh, mail by rail was, was kind of a dangerous, or sorry, traveling by rail was a dangerous undertaking in those days. And uh, there's, there's another story built in there with the trip travel insurance. And you'll see a huge amount of mail to the accident insurance company in, in Montreal. And uh, again, story for another day. This is an example of the of four of the types of split ring uh, hammers that got uh, incorporated in the 1850s, 1860s. And you'll notice we've got the, the Upper Canada still in use, Canada West still in use, Ontario without the, the period, and Ontario with the period. And uh, there's all kinds of these devices. And uh, it, it took me a while before I had the aha moment to realize that, uh, you know, when you see in the books, it's a split ring hammer there was more than one split ring hammer because they had more than one clerk and they didn't share hammers. So I say, I've now identified 39 different hammers of these, of this type. And, uh, but I'm not showing them because it's, it's boring. However, this one is the earliest use of the upper Canada split ring hand stamp. And it's nice because it's on a free letter, but which has been endorsed by uh, the sender, uh, who is in the office of the receiver general? So he's a, he's a tax man. There is the introduction of the mailboxes and uh, Mr. Griffiths, the postmaster general has sent a, a letter to the mayor of Toronto saying, guess what? We've put 12 mailboxes in your city. There's where they are. And uh, it was <laughs> telling the postmaster as well, please make sure that the mail gets picked up out of those things. And, I'm not even sure why I got this picture in here. 
Oh, it's the hand stamp. It's not paid five cents. We saw the previous one paid three pence. This is now paid five cents as we're on decimal currency now. In 1862, the post office in Toronto now has a postmaster, an assistant postmaster, nine clerks handling incoming mail, seven clerks processing delivery mail, two guys out collecting uh, from the letter boxes, six letter carriers, a messenger, and one on contract to carry the mail to the railway station. And one of the funny, interesting things I discovered from the 1862 post office staffing report is that one of the things that you could not get at the post office was stamps. They did not sell postage stamps to the public. They sold postage stamps to agents at a 4% discount. And you could go to a number of bookstores or stationery stores to buy stamps. And strangely enough, right next door to the post office was a stationery store owned by the father of the assistant postmaster. A little bit of uh, inside trading there. Now we're using hand stamps for some of the rates again. So this is one cent on a, on a drop letter. Uh, kind of a nice little strike and uh, tough to find. There is what I think is one of the prettiest postmarks in, in the city of Toronto is this lovely diamond grid uh, hand stamp. Um, 1863 is not an anywhere near an early date. It seemed to start around late 1859 or early 1860. I'm just not sure when, but I think it's a, it's a, a real pretty looking device. And uh, when you see it on a, on a clean piece of mail, it's just, it is most attractive. I, I happen to be a sucker for nice looking covers. Now we've got the a, a paid 10. And I say they're, they're getting more, uh, more hand stamps with rates uh, pre-built into them. Uh, unfortunately, the, uh, the the difficulty with all these red hand stamps is they don't show up well when you scan them for, uh, for Zoom presentations. Uh, this is a scarifying grid canceling device. These things are tough to find, um, but there's three dots are in the center, as you can see here. And the idea was they make pins out of those so that when the, uh, when the letter was canceled, it put holes in the stamp to prevent reuse. Uh, strangely enough, people have been cleaning stamps and uh, making a uh, uh, cheating on the post office. Uh, but those pins wore thin and uh, and broke off, so they they kind of lost their use as a scarifying device and just became a canceling device. So you got to look for the three the three black marks. And uh, and by the way, I'm running slow. How am I doing for time, Joan? Am I? Well, we're we're pretty much at time, Garfield. Okay, well, I'm, I'm, you... okay, I'll, I'll I'll go a little quicker here. Uh, this is the introduction of the AM and the PM marks on the on the Canada West hand stamp. Uh, we get into some of the fancy twos, and if you want to see that, please check out Alec Globe's exhibit on the, on the Badaf's website. Absolutely fascinating. Uh, somebody said that there was only one of them, but I think Alex figured out there's about 30 different number twos. So definitely worth having a look at it uh, when he shows it. Now, Toronto is also getting into some of the fancy cancels in, in the 1870s. So here's a lovely example of, a, of the hand stamp. Um, they just couldn't get new obliterators in fast enough, so they made their own. Another new single circle. And again, without the year and the date. So the only way you can get the year is either by a receiving mark or by the contents. This one happens to be a receipt in there. And uh, fortunately, the receipt is addressed to the same guy that's uh, on the cover. So pretty good indicator. This is the Toronto's fifth post office. And it's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful building. On, again, just up the street from the uh, Toronto's first. Uh, young and Adelaide. And... Uh, it's rather prominent on postcards. And if you ever see this little building in front, that's a public lavatory. It has nothing to do with the post office, but uh, I, I got criticized very heavily for showing this once without mentioning that it was a, a lavatory. So there you are, I've, uh, I've redeemed myself in this one. And 
Thomas Patterson became the postmaster in 1879. It was a nice political appointment because he, John A. Macdonald owed him a favor. And uh, Patterson had gone broke running newspapers and doing everything else. And uh, they said, what would you like? He said, I'd like to be the postmaster in Toronto. So they uh, retired Joseph Leslie with a huge pension, made Patterson the postmaster, and uh, he carried on. He managed to uh, the bankrupt the, the mail, and they sold the remnants to the Globe, so you got the Globe and Mail newspaper. Um, Leslie got a pension of $2,500 a year, and the Globe editorial criticized it, saying it's a disgrace that the country should be to this expense, so that the uh, guy can get a free ride from the government. But he was a good postmaster. He uh, he ran a pretty good shop. Uh, the population's now up to 86,000. And by the end of the decade, it was up to 180,000. Uh, he'd hired a guy named Fallis Johnson to collect mail from 70 street mailboxes now. Uh, they annexed places like Downsview, Norway, Doncaster, Deer Park, Parkdale, Brockton. So you, you've seen these names on the uh, street post office material. And a new regulation came in that every letter in for Toronto should have the, the name, street, and number, no matter how well known that name may be. So the, uh, the carriers could get the mail out. There is the uh, a use of the registered mail hand stamp uh, on, obviously on registered mail using the registration, the uh, special registration labels. We ended up also having a, a whole series of duplex postmarks. That is a huge study unto itself. And uh, uh, that, was, that was done very nicely by our, our dear friend up in Ottawa, uh, who's done a great book on. And there's another very rare postmark that is the Toronto with a dotted inner ring. Uh, this, this stamp was also used in Ottawa, and there's five strikes of it known from Ottawa, and probably less than 30 from Toronto. And uh, between Kim O'Salone and myself, we have 22 of them. We also have the orb postmarks, uh, the two and the three ring. And again, there's all kinds of variations on these things. Uh, so it's not just a, a, a two a two item study. The squared circles became very popular in, in the in the 1890s, but also this the precursor to the squared circle was also a very attractive uh, device, and you're going to see that one used on the I think one of the covers for Capex as well. And we also get in late in the 1890s into the machine cancellations. Uh, there's a whole series of those. This guy, Edward Rawlings, is the guy that shows up on the trip travel insurance for the train stuff. And quick rundown, the, the Union Station is the post office that didn't exist. Uh, there's a whole interesting story behind this, and I'm trying to build an exhibit on it. But uh, I thought I had all the street post offices lined up, and lo and behold, we get these Toronto Union Railway stations and I thought only places that had post offices had canceling devices, but there never was a post office in Union Station until 1927. But here's stuff canceled in, in between 1875 and 1882. So it's some, some neat stuff. There's still a lot of research to, to do on, on this, uh, but I've now found 24 covers uh, that went through Union Station. And that's a, a study unto itself. Trip, a story for another day. 1881, Patterson got found that you couldn't handle the post office out of one office. They started to establish branch offices. There was the downtown. So we did a Toronto East, a Toronto North, and a Toronto West. And there's items from the West, the East, and the North. And that's a presentation for another day if I get invited back again. And uh, I'd, I'd love to do that story because it's, it's a fun story. And a question that I'd leave everybody with, I've seen this hand stamp for the inquiry office. If anybody can tell me what the inquiry office is, where it was, why it was called the inquiry office, I'd be delighted to know. I have a feeling that it was set up for bulk mail somewhere in the back 
of that lovely brick building on, on Adelaide Street, but I cannot find any evidence of who staffed it, what it did, where it was, and uh, and why it was there. Why was the mail handled in a separate? Why was the mail segregated? And there she be. So thank you very much for being so patient, people. I appreciate it so much. Well, Garfield, that that was fantastic. I mean, more about Toronto, and it just makes you want to go to Capex all the more. Um, I am going to start bringing people over so they could talk to you directly. Uh, let me just uh, take down your screen share here. And there are some questions in the Q&A. So if you want to go ahead, uh, this, one of the first ones was about, do you know why Postmaster uh, Howard was fired? Yes. Uh, he, he was fired because he was accused of being an accomplice to the uh, to the rebels. Uh, when Bertsy opened the mail, he found some some mail that uh, obviously went through the Toronto Post Office, and they said that Howard was accommodating the rebels, and Bertsy wanted the job. <laughs> That's probably a good reason. Now. Um, someone wanted just a little geography for some of us um, who are in uh, in the United States and are not too familiar with Canada. Upper Canada, Lower Canada, uh, could you go into that a little bit? Because some people were, you know, it's a little confusing for us down in. Okay, Upper, upper Canada is, when, when you look at a map of North America now, the area that is identified as being the province of Ontario was Upper Canada. The province of Quebec was Lower Canada. And, and of course, you know, the, the Maritimes stood unto themselves, that being uh, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, and, uh, and PEI. And Newfoundland was a separate colony until 1949, so it didn't even enter into this period at all. It's hilarious. Okay, so when when uh, you come over, people, just please put on your your um, videos and ask Garfield some questions. Let's see Bob Vogel there. Hi, Bob. And, uh, so, due to the expense of postage, what was the primary subject of letters back then? I mean, we're talking way back at the introduction when we went through the cost of That's all crazy. those. Wow. Well, when, when I see domestic letters, uh, a lot of the domestic letters were, uh, uh, were, were commercial. It was either sales of properties or, or whatever. There was a lot of legal correspondence. Uh, much of the mail that's, uh, that's available today is is addressed to lawyers. It's either to or, to or from lawyers. And uh, of course they keep their stuff forever in a day uh, until it falls into the hands of a collector. Um, I don't think there was that much social. There, there, there was social mail going back home to Europe. Uh, you know, that big broadsheet that I mentioned, uh, I think the guy was writing that for about three months before he sent the, the letter back to his dad who had been in Toronto or at, at, at some stage of the game. And uh, he had stories about everybody that, uh, that they knew in the, in the city. And that's why it was such a, a huge letter. Uh, so there's a lot of catching up to do for, you know, for those people. Really interesting. Now you noted York Mills as the Northern Post Office, and this is from Michael. Um, was there a West and an East Post Office? Well, the, the, in 1881, they opened up the, the three branches. Now, the Toronto West Branch was at Bathurst Street, which uh, is about two kilometers west of, of what is now Toronto's first post office. And it, the city still wasn't all that big geographically. Uh, the North Branch was two to three kilometers north of, uh, of, the down, of what is now the downtown core. And the Toronto East Branch was uh, not even not even a kilometer east of the of the post office. Interesting. And a kilometer for the really... Americans is about six tenths of a mile. Okay. Chris Green. Uh, I I am bringing people over. If you want priority, please raise your hand, and I will bring you over. It's just me and my fingers bringing you over. So. Hi, Chris. Good to see you. 
ideas. Why? Well, Chris has always got something to say. Garfield, I, I have a question for you, Garfield. Yes, you say, you say you like messy covers, and then you said you like those, you're a sucker for those really neat covers. What's in between? Um, hey, <laughs> everything else. <laughs> You know, you know what, Bob? If it's if it comes from that time period and it's got a it's got a Toronto postmarking, there's you know there's there's something to look at. And oh I yeah. Think that, you know, funnily enough, I, I think that the the amount of Toronto stuff out there isn't as great as it could be. I I, I believe that people said, ah, there's going to be all kinds of Toronto crap out there, so they didn't preserve it. And uh, trying to find some of this stuff is uh, is a challenge. Yeah, although one would think there'd be more Toronto stuff and everything else put together. Great presentation. I've seen parts of it before, but that was wonderful again tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's the first time I've seen the whole thing because I, I was revising it up until 4.30. So I, I hadn't, uh, that was the first time I'd ever seen the whole show. Maybe we can talk Ken Lemke and do, doing one for Hamilton. Yeah, Ken, can you have that one done for next month? Oh, I'm actually doing a Hamilton one for the Royal in September. Oh, terrific! Yeah, it'll be it'll be on illustrated covers. Oh, which is and I think the Royal has opened it up to everybody now. Yeah, right. You don't have to be a member to attend, so. Get the word out. I think that would be great, Ken. Yeah, I think if you go to the Royal website, it, uh, they're listed. Like, for instance, um, this month's is on perfins and pre-cancer. Next month will be on specialization. So Joe Trousey has put together a whole pile of subjects, and he seconded me to find speakers. Oh. So if anybody here wants to see, I'm looking for volunteers. Actually, the, 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 the Monday Night Royal presentations have really been wonderful presentations. And, uh, yeah. They're enjoyable, even if you're not presenting, just to watch like these, very enjoyable. Garfield, I have a question for you. Yes, John. Um, sorry, I, I was a bit late um, getting on tonight. I came in when you were talking about York. Yeah. And I was trying to work out what the significance of York was when I, I guess we were, the scene was Toronto. Was York a, 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 read, um, a division of Toronto? No, York was York was a swamp when uh, when when Simcoe arrived. Uh, there was, essentially the government was looking for a place to establish a seat of government uh, because the uh, the town of New Newark, which is now or, or Queenston, which is now Niagara on the Lake, uh, was too close to the American border for comfort, and. Uh, you know, actually, the Americans could stand on American soil and lob a shot into uh, into into Queenston without any difficulty. So they thought it was a good idea to, to move the capital somewhere else. So Simcoe was charged with the responsibility of you know beetling off and finding a new piece of property. And uh, Toronto was a, a lovely site because the uh, there's a natural harbor in Toronto with the the Toronto Islands out in the lake uh, forming a nice little barricade. So they, they built the city or the town of York just inland from the island with the idea was very easy to defend by putting a, a fort at the at the at the, the western channel. Okay. Uh, so that became a very comfortable place to, to set up and uh, but it was a, it was a, it was a swampy piece of land. Uh, full were there of any problems with, the, with swamp borne diseases when they set up? Uh, I'm sorry? Any problems with swamp-borne diseases when they set up? Uh, from what I've read, they, they did have some uh, some medical issues at the time, yeah. I have another query. about. Uh, uh, while you were talking about 
Upper Canada, Lower Canada. I got up my um, my atlas. <laughs> okay. And, and and looking at it, it seems that Toronto appears to be one of the most southerly parts of Canada. <laughs> yes, it's called Upper Canada, unless unless I haven't got the the, the map uh, all even taken well, correctly. Upper Canada was mentioned. It was sort of measured from the Atlantic Ocean. Ah, right. I suspect. So measured along the, the Lawrence River. The yeah. So going up the river, uh, which which geographically seems uh, the, the Saint Lawrence River kind of flows northeast. Mm. Well, that's if yeah. we're ta really okay. talking Quebec, the Maritimes, and uh, Ontario and Ontario Province. There, that's. That is kind of up there. It's all the new provinces probably um, made it look, brought it down. Yeah, I, well, of course, I, what shows on your map there is Ontario was Upper Canada. Mm -hmm. And what shows on your map is Quebec was Lower Canada. Yeah. And what's what's west of, uh, of, of Ontario is, is now Manitoba. Manitoba. But that was that was the north part of the Northwest Territories at the time. The Northwest Territories incorporated uh, Manitoba, uh, uh, Saskatchewan, and Alberta, and everything north of that. Is there a rare, rarity um, uh, uh, listing of the different postmarks? No, there's not. Uh, well. No, I, not uh -huh. really. I, 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 something to do. <laughs> yeah, I, and you know, I, I think that most of them aren't terribly rare. I, I think that dotted inner ring one is pretty rare. Uh, you know, just because you can't find the darn things. Um, but you know, most of the others, there, there seems to be lots out there. But finding good strikes of them is a is a challenge. Um, of course, that's always the, that's always the challenge when you're playing the postal history game is is to find a nice strike or an early strike. Was Toronto at that point at the point you you've been you talk, spoke about? Was it a national post office? Was it a regional post office? Was the other regions also having their own post offices? Um, well, of course, uh, virtually every town had its own post office. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, I guess you call it a town post office, but uh, Toronto kind of expanded, but that's why for the longest time, Toronto only had one office, uh, uh, you know, right up until 1880, uh, when they started to open up the three branch offices. And then between 1880 and 1897, uh, they opened up 20, 28 other smaller offices called street post offices. And they said, that's a wonderful story for another day. Then at the turn of the century, uh, they started opening up uh, franchise post office and drugstores all over the place. And that's the, for, uh, the forerunner of what we've got today with the postal franchises and shoppers, drug marts, and, and so on. Hmm. How did the uh, development of the Welland Canal impact Toronto's mail? I don't think it did. Oh. Uh, I mean, it's a, really, the, I mean, the, the whole deal for the Welland Canal was, was commerce that was able to get by Niagara Falls. And so, so that really didn't affect the, the mail uh, because by then the, the mail was being shipped by rail anyhow. Uh, so it was quicker through through rail sources. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And of course, once you, once once Union Station got built in, uh, uh, or once the, the, the Grand Trunk Railway was completed in the Union Station uh, in 1859, uh, suddenly the, uh, the Toronto became the hub of the of the mail. They were able to run mail by rail to all points east again. So. Uh, you know, even into New York on a regular basis. And that's a very interesting story is the development of the Grand Trunk Railway. And I'd leave that to the railway uh, post office guys. But that's a fascinating story about how they had to coordinate the, the building of the railways and the schedules and the number of trains to, to meet the post office uh, commitments. 
Pretty cool mm -hmm. story. Yeah. Garfield, this is uh, Chris Savage. Um, what happened to mail going west? Did all the mail coming into Canada and traveling west just stop in Toronto? Or was there some way of actually getting mail go to get out into, I don't know, Winnipeg and other, other cities? Or did it have to go around and come in through Vancouver? How did that work? Uh, well, actually, mail could be distributed through Toronto. And there's, I mean, there's a lot of... Uh, a lot of mail went through Toronto two points west. Uh, to tell you the truth, I haven't done much of a study of, of that. Uh, you know, the, the, the development of the Western mails was, was really, really interesting. And the, the only mail that I've looked at to or from the West <coughs> that came out of the Riel Rebellion. Mm. And, and that, that mail was carried on the, on the Intercontinental Railway from, from Manitoba uh, two points east. And of course, for points east, Toronto was the distribution point because there were any number of railways running into Toronto's Union Station. So it, right. it became a major redistribution point. Excuse me. Um, I'm surprised to see such late stampless use in Toronto. I mean, you got all the way into the mid 1860s or maybe even a little later than that. And there certainly never, never seemed to be a short supply of stamps or mail coming out. So why was that still entertained? Oh, because uh, prepayment by postage stamp was not compulsory in Canada until 1875. So there's, uh, there's, there's all kinds of, uh, all kinds of stampless mail up to 1875. Hmm. UPU. So it's a, and that that can become a, a whole interesting study for people. It's a, you, know, you you had a choice of you, you could you could pay in cash or you could pay by stamp. Now they say the uh, the Toronto Post Office in 1862 elected not to sell stamps. They would prefer you go someplace else to buy your stamps and and, and carry the stamp mail into them, or they would accept cash or you could mail it collect at the other end. And may I jump in from New Zealand? Absolutely. Welcome. It's I'm going to take advantage of the Canadian collectors. I'm not a postal historian. I collect single stamps used of British Empire. And I just happened to turn my album open and lo and behold, found a Toronto cancellation. Beautiful. I have a question about cancellations, Garfield. Can you hear me? Y yes, I can. Yes. Okay, this is Chris from Saskatoon. Um, I have a question, I'm just curious if there are any of those cancellation devices uh, still left. They've got a couple of them in the um, Toronto's first post office as museum pieces. Oh, I see. And, okay. uh, and thank goodness they, they do guard them carefully so that uh, people don't go well, creating historical covers in the 21st century. Yeah, that was a thought of mine. Garfield, Sorry. a lovely presentation. Thank you. But I'm, I'm wondering how difficult is it to find mail from the rebellion? Damn tough. Uh, I have one letter from the Mackenzie Rebellion. It's from the uh, Riel Rebellion. And uh, George Arfkin in his book said there were 25 known pieces from the real rebellion uh, minus 20 the, the number 26 it wasn't recorded in his census um, but i don't think there's much more mail than that floating around yeah the it, it was a very small contingent that went west examples i've seen were in uh bill longley's auction some years ago i got mine from longley yeah yeah, he Bill called me one Saturday morning and said, Are you going to be home today? And I said, Yeah, he says, Good, I'm coming to you with a cover. Have a check ready. Yeah. Just a, if you don't mind this personal question, Garfield Porch. Is yes. there an, I've never, how did that name come about? Um, I was given it. Porch. No, what, what is it? You know, what, any story behind the, name, the last name Porch? Not that I really know about. Um, 
you know, we, we don't really have any, any super claim to fame. I had a, a sort of a great, great uncle who was a postmaster in England. Mm -hmm. uh, my brother was a sergeant at, at arms of the Vagabonds Motorcycle Club. Um, <laughs> and beyond that, I don't think we've ever done anything that uh, would get us into the books. Uh, there's not many nope. of us around. No partnerships like port called like porch and house. You know, like Porsche, I think of Porsche and cars, you know, that's, you know, when it, Garfield, I found out Garfield was a racer. Well, they, so they, but they, they don't spell their car name right. Yeah, I know. They, we, we should tell them that. Well, it's a Volkswagen, right? I know. Damn German cars. I don't like German cars anyhow. That's another story. <laughs> I, Can I, I jump finish, back to uh, Stokes for a moment? Um, I've got a, um, an 1859 in Victoria, Canada, postage stamp with a manuscript cross on it. Now, would this have been used for revenue purposes uh, as a document uh, and you, the cross used as a signature, or would it have been a cancellation by a carrier? It, it's, it was probably cancelled by a postmaster. Uh, postmasters were instructed that if they did not have cancellation devices and, and a lot of uh, smaller post offices were slow to receive the uh, the metallic uh, cancelling devices, the date stamps. So they're instructed to uh, put a manuscript date on the cover and cancel the stamp using a pen and put a cross on it. Fine, thank you. Does, does that make them particularly desirable? Um, no, it, it makes them nicely used without a without a date. Um, also, from a forensic viewpoint, it's one of the things that we look for at the Green Foundation when people submit the uh, mint stamps from the mid nineteenth century. We look for that cancel to be removed because they uh, they can be bleached out and right. then the stamp get regummed and sold as a mint. Yeah, never can I call you back? I'm on a Zoom. But the uh, other. Yeah, it, it was a very common way to do it. Okay, thank I, you for that. I have thank a you so much for a wonderful presentation and for your dry and non-PC sense of humor. Much appreciated. Uh, thanks, Sean. I have a question. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. Quick question. Uh, I just got to finish listening to a book on Hamilton and Rensselaer is mentioned. Do you think that Rensselaer in this particular is a, uh, related to Hamilton? Uh, their family. You mean the, the city of Hamilton? No, I'm talking about um, I'm 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 talking about uh, Alexander Hamilton and Rensselaer. Okay. Now the the, the Rensselaer family was, uh, from what I can understand, was a, a an extremely prominent family in in New York, uh, New York State, and uh, from the last, if, from what I've seen in researching that one letter. Uh, they were into virtually everything. So they got towns named after them. They got libraries <laughs> named after them. Uh, so I, I suspect that like you know, families that are so prominent, they're, they're probably connected to everybody and everything. Uh, it's like Livingston and so on. Phillips. Yeah, but they're, they, they, they had super wealth for the, for the period. Super wealth. I have a question relating to the slide you showed. The slide you showed that had those fancy twos. Oh yes, yes, the Alec Globe presentation. Oh, you, you're, sorry, Lou, you're, you're muted. You, Louis, you're muted. I am so sorry. I was trying to drown out the noise, and I did that to you. You could shoot me later. Uh, we'll let I it go this lie. time. Okay. Um, so yes. So. The name of the individual was Dr. Alec Globe. Globe, yes. And you mentioned that there was information visible or available on a website. Which one was it? I, I believe it's on the, the BNAPS, the BNAPS.org. I've not heard of that. B -O British, the, yeah, British North America Philatelic Society. Ah, okay. You should Great join group. It's, yeah, a, it's a wonderful or if, if you're going to if you're going to uh, be involved in in the philately of British North America 
that's a, that's an organization that you should belong to. Yeah, Shoot me a note and I'll get, yeah, we'll get on the website because it is definitely uh, one group worth worth joining. Oh, yeah. it's it's absolutely worth joining. $35 Canadian per year. Yeah, well, Ken, Ken is the, the past president of Benaps, and uh, it, was, it was under Ken's leadership that I became an emeritus member. For, what's that, Ken, 40 years a member? I don't know. A long time. And never regretted oh, a moment. Emeritus is 40, yeah. yeah. Never regretted a moment of membership either. There was... It's, it's the best membership fees you can spend. Oh, thank you, Mike. Yeah, it's um, you have a lot of different chapters. I, I just joined um, Bill Longley said, oh, you're not a member. You guys have to be a member. And it's just been phenomenal. Yeah, and for researchers, the, the number of uh, study groups at BNAPS uh, now have all of their newsletters online. And uh, my goodness, that's a, that's a rabbit hole. You can go down and you can spend a lot of hours uh, reading that stuff. There's there's hidden there's hidden stuff there that's never made the books. Yeah, the and and all of the uh, study group information, except for the last five years, is online. To get the last five years, you've got to be a member. Yeah, Mike, I think that uh, that collection that you're referring to, Mike, is the uh, the residue of uh, Alec Globe's research. Yeah, he never told me where the source of it was, but uh, I got to got to peek at it for him. So, thanks. Yeah, it's it's powerful, powerful stuff, and uh, it's it's lovely material. Yeah, I'll, I'll add that Alex's uh, research is astronomical. It's second to none. Is that Excellent. it? <laughs> We're just getting set to publish a new book for Alec now through the Green Foundation. I'd like to know if the information that you gave us tonight about the Toronto history, if there's um, available information uh, corresponding to the Montreal post offices from their beginning. And uh, you know what, I, I don't know, Louis, and I'll tell you something, there's very little published information on Toronto. 90% 90, 90 of uh, what I presented tonight is original research. There's just, uh, it's, it's just, it's just not out there. You, you, you can, you can scrounge through the, uh, uh, the, the old city of York Hysterical Society uh, or you know others other historical societies and you can find little tidbits here and there but there doesn't seem to be any continuous uh, detail of information um, I guess that's what what makes it a lot of fun you, you you know 50 years of research goes into that yeah so Garfield that leads to another comment uh, when are you going to publish this well, for the last 35 years, my wife has been calling this my great unpublished works. And uh, you know, uh, what you see behind me in those, uh, those binders, that's the, uh, that's the rest of it. It's, it's the research files there. So there's, there's an awful lot of it. And maybe I'll publish it. I don't know, Bob. Well, maybe, I'll die and, maybe I'll die and leave it to somebody else and they can publish it. Well, that, that's, that's my point, though. If you're gone or when you go, hopefully not for a long time. Uh, it'll be lost. Yeah, I haven't so got time to reinvent, reinvent, reinvent the wheel, and that shouldn't be. Yeah. Um, you got a lovely tool with the Green Foundation that will publish it. Yeah, listen, I haven't got time to die. I got a lot of work left to do in this thing, and uh... well, that's why one of the I feel putting these talks online and making them free and available to everyone is very, very important because that way. When you have a topic, you could everyone Googles things nowadays and they, they get Garfield's presentation. And that should start, you know, at least who's Garfield? Let me contact him and, and really start the ball rolling. So uh, it, it's, I, I'm glad you're doing that, Joan, because it's an excellent way of, of getting this thing out to people. 
like uh, just noticing like New Zealand, Thailand. Uh, this is great. You've hooked me. You've hooked me. That's for sure. <laughs> well, I'm sorry we only have one a month because, I mean, there's a lot of topics, but you can live on Zoom now with all the different talks. And exactly. nice to see you, Mike. You got your camera working. I was sorry. I was bringing people over. So. Well, the, this whole exercise has been uh, an experiment for me because my computer melted down completely. I, I had nothing. So piecing it together uh, has been traumatic to say the least. And Zoom, of course, I needed to view something to make sure everything was working. And actually, I'm very glad I did because I've enjoyed Garfield's uh, presentation very much. Thank so, you, Mike. Thank you, Garfield. Thank you, computer. And thank you, Joan. Thanks for those comments. You know, it's, it's a whole lot of fun doing this stuff. And, uh, you know, it's, it's always fun talking about things that you love doing. And, and one of the, the huge advantages that I've found is that, and, and this, is, this is not a request, but when, when you go out to shows and so on, people walk up to you and say, this will probably fit in your presentation i you know i saw your presentation and here's a here's an item that just might fit um you know and that's one of the real delightful side you know, side branches of, of what we're doing the other nice thing i find is people tell you information that you know you, you thought you had that nailed you knew that and then someone will come along and say no you know i have this and that isn't the right direction and, and it makes you really think and consider. And you, there's a lot with the technology, you could get input from all over the world, which is, I think you know, it's fantastic because here in the United States, I do Nova Scotia. I could talk to people in Canada who, you know, I have a misconception and they'll correct it right away, which is just fantastic. Well, if I can throw a little plug here, one of the things that I, we've been doing in our West Toronto Stamp Club is that uh, we've been having used to be called a study group and we renamed it a discussion group because the term study scared people away. And uh, I've been chairing that since 1996. And we, we finally went uh, with the program on, on Zoom in June of 2020, just as the pandemic started. And uh, we do a Zoom session once a month and we pick a subject and, and just completely beat it up and it's a wide open discussion. And next Tuesday night, we're doing registered mail. Uh, if anybody would like to get an invitation to come to our registered mail session, just pop me an email and I'll put you on our guest list. And uh, and you stay on the guest list until you request to get off it. Uh, but it's, it's free. There's no obligation. And uh, we'd love to have people on. But if you come, you're expected to contribute, too. Joan, might I bring something else on it in just share? Just Certainly, go right ahead, um, John. As you all probably know, the Hawaiian Islands were once one time British and they were known as the Sandwich Islands. Yeah. Now, is there anyone amongst your guests that knows anything, has any mail or anything, uh, any documents from the Sandwich Islands? Mm -hmm. Or is there a, um, a, a study circle? Yeah, there, there's, a couple Hawaii, big, there's a couple of big collectors that I, I know of. Keith just left the room, but we could get you, you know, I, I'll make a note of that and try to hook you up if no one here could answer the questions. Most, most of the big collectors in Hawaii have since passed on. So it's, yeah, it's more mainland now. I, well, I, I was in Hawaii last summer. The reason I ask is because I've got a, a very, very old document from um, what was then the Sandwich Islands um, with, a, with a very large, well, it's broken, but it's, it's it, all the pieces are there, with a very large red wax seal. Um, hmm. 
I just wonder if there's any any more of that stuff around. I mean, it's difficult to know whether it's postal history or what it is, but it it it, it was on a document that obviously went through the post at one stage. Um, but I can't find out um, anything about it. I can't. I I I only know that the the Sandwich Islands were were latterly the Hawaiian Islands. Well, that's about it. I can tell you that's a pretty tough destination, destination for mail. South America down by the Falklands. Which sandwich oh, islands are we talking about? We're talking about Hawaii. Sorry, Sorry this is Chris Savage. I thought the sandwich islands were down past the Falkland Islands. Or the I thought down the Magellan. Yeah, they're they're the South Sandwich Islands. They're the, they're the oh, South okay. Sandwich Islands. Different sandwiches, obviously. Yeah. Okay. John, you can send it to me. I might be able to figure it out. Yeah. These are instant. Yeah. Steve, if you don't uh, have Steve's email, we'll, we'll hook the two of you up. Steve has done some amazing work at sleuthing out some some things he's just things that are not known he finds them out i think uh, another fantastic researcher well thank you <laughs> is anyone going to uh london 2022 i think it's a fortnight's time anyone coming across the pond we'll see you there who was that <laughs> chris green Good for you, Chris. You, you're braver than I. You know, I got scared with the we're on again and like you're going to be quarantined. I wish they didn't do that because I would have been a little bit more. Um, I, I would have been more secure in booking. That's that that that's all come to an end, you know. Yeah. We don't quarantine people coming in. Uh, we stop wearing masks on public transport and in meetings. Uh, we're, we're, well, Garfield, what is this? Train, we're just coming out of it. Garfield, now, now that you've uh, conquered Toronto, what are you going to do next? Oh, I, I still got a lot of work to do on the on the Toronto project, but I am also my main collection is uh, small queens, and uh, I'm still working on small queens destinations and uh, rates and routes. Uh, then I got about 25 other little rabbit holes that I've tried to go down and uh, <laughs> like to compute, you know, work on a few of those things as well. Uh, and we plan to get you back in August to finish the tale because yeah, as we are going through this, you know, we could have been here another two hours. And as you saw, Garfield kept saying, there's another story, there's another story. <laughs> so. We, we plan to get him back for, you know, because he's such a, a resource to get him back again in August to tell us a little bit more about the, the uh, end part of this story. Yeah, yeah. the fun part that I'll, I'll hit in August is uh, the Union Station story, which I, I think is absolutely fascinating. Uh, but then the, the development of the, of the branch post offices in Toronto, the, the opening of the street post offices, and if you if you're looking in auction catalogs, you'll see places like you know York Street and Elm Street and Peter Street and Queen Street and Queen Street East, and uh, you know, and the, the development of those offices is absolutely a fascinating story for uh, for the last twenty years of the of the nineteenth century, and uh, it, it's it's a story I love telling. I think it will be fabulous. Mm. All right. Any more questions for Garfield? It's been really enjoyable. Well, great presentation. Thank you very thank you. much. Well, I'd like to thank everybody for making this a possible night. I, it, it's a treat to be able to bring and brag. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Garfield. That was great. Yeah, thanks. thanks so much, everybody. Yeah. From an ex-Torontonian living overseas, 
it brought back lots of memories, all these main places and, uh, and so on. So thank you very much. Why Wonderful. did you leave Toronto? Oh, I left Toronto about uh, 20 years ago. Why? It was too warm. Work, work and gonna... work. I live, I live in Costa Rica. This is going to be a great place when they finish it. <laughs> what? <laughs> Toronto? Oh, yeah. It's all under construction now. We, you, know, you, you can't go a kilometer away. Without... Yeah. They spent all winter breaking it up with the snow plows and then fixing it up in the summertime. So that was wonderful. Well, actually, we're, we're tearing it all down now and turning it into a condominium. <laughs> Yeah, well, I'll be coming there, Garfield. I was there in 1951, and they were busy tearing up the uh, boulevard, or whatever it's called, to build the uh, subway. Yeah, we're well, still we're building the subway. We're, we're still doing it. Yeah, they they, they got the east west subway going now on on Eglinton Avenue. That's still a, a, a massive hole in the ground and uh, a massive hole in the bankroll of the city. But uh, they say it'll, it'll be it'll be a fantastic place when they finish it. I remember I used to fly into the island airport, going by everybody's apartment windows <laughs> years ago. Yep, yep. Port, well, Porter Porter port Airlines is back in business now after the pandemic, and uh, the island airport is a is a going concern. Yeah, uh, used to used to have uh, the stamp shows in in, in the uh, the warmest part of uh, January. Frank Bruno's show downtown. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, you can still fly into the into the island airport and take the shuttle service and take you right almost to the front door of the Capex show. Are they going to tour the Toronto post offices in at Capex? Are they going to have a little side tour? I, I don't know if the if Toronto's first is going to have anything there or not. I know that the Canada Post is finally coming out of its uh, out of its hole and uh, and they're coming to the show. But uh, again, Toronto's first post office is within a a short walk of the Capex site, hmm. so you'd be able to get in there and mail a letter and get an eighteen thirty four cancellation on it. <laughs> And meet some lovely people. They've got some great folks in there working in that office because uh, it's 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 a working museum. Is really what it is. So and I bring one of my own old covers, get it stamped, and then bring it down to the foundation to see if you could. <laughs> <laughs> well, the stamp the, the stamp they use now it's a it's a it's a rubber stamp, so it's. Oh. Uh, uh, it's easily identifiable as a forgery if you try to uh, pass it off today. Okay. But it's in red. No, they do a lovely job, and uh, I say great people. Just great people. Actually, the curator just uh, just left and, and took a position as... Uh, a curator at the Aga Khan Museum, which is a rather prestigious uh, new museum in Toronto. Very good, gentlemen. And uh, once again, Garfield, thanks very much for a wonderful presentation. Joan, thanks for organizing it all. And uh, see you guys and folks at the next session. Well, good thank you, you for coming. Yeah. Thank you. Well, we enjoy this. Thank you. It's just uh, 1 a.m. now in the UK, so I'll say good night to everyone. Yeah, Bye -bye. John, I've been thinking of whether we should change this to the 5.30, bring it back a half hour, and, uh, okay. you know, I'll... I'm a night owl yeah. anyway. It doesn't matter okay. Oh, no, thank you, John. Keep it at 6. I know, you'll have to wake up too early. <laughs> exactly. Garfield, maybe you should put uh, the... Uh, your email on uh, on the chat line for the next Tuesday night's meeting, possibly, and uh, anybody who wants to come, it's going to be a great night. Uh, okay, yeah, sure. it's just it's just Garfield porch at gmail .com. So if you if if you flip me an email, I'll put you on the list and be, be happy to have you on board on Tuesday and all subsequent Tuesdays. 
Yeah, if you didn't catch that, just shoot us a note and we'll forward it right on to Garfield or, or Bob. Yeah, yeah, and I put you on the list the other night, Joan. After we yeah. after we converse, so you don't oh. you don't have to request it. <laughs> Thank you, Garfield. It's your email. Is it all lowercase? And is Garfield Porch all one word, or is there oh. a dot oh. between Garfield and Porch? There's a dot between, and it's it's all lowercase. Garfield dot Porch. Okay. At at gmail.com. Gmail okay, that's great. I'll contact you. Fantastic. I look forward to seeing you. And uh, I say anybody that comes on board for these meetings, you're you're entitled, you're invited to participate, encouraged to participate. And uh, when we say registered mail, it doesn't matter where it's from or where it's to. It's uh, all forms of registered mail. Okay. So, Chris, if you join us, you just wouldn't dig into your inventory and. Uh... <laughs> you know, I, I always wish they'd bring back those problem sessions. Like the foundation used to have them where you have, you know, is this, you know, what is it? Is it real? Is it a fake? And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I haven't said, Keith would really rave about them. Those, That's a good idea. That's a, there's, a, there's a project for the Green Garfield. <laughs> oh, thank you, Chris. <laughs> well, as a matter of fact, you know, I think we pretty much do that with a, we have a Thursday morning coffee group as well, uh, uh, working out of the West Toronto, and uh, Ken Pugh is a regular attendee at that one. So that becomes a fakes and forgery session almost every Thursday. Keith used to love those at the foundation when, when the guys would get together and, and uh, you know, and just chat. And I would, you know, I've never seen one. So I'd love to see a Zoom with, you know, here it is. What do you think, guys? Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, the other session that we have at the West Toronto, uh, Ian Robertson, and Ian's online with us here tonight, too, I see. Uh, Ian has a program called the Learning Workshop. And again, we take a subject and just we beat the bejeebers out of it. Uh, there, and Ian, what's, what's on for the next one? The Admirals, is it, for the next one? It's, it'll be an admirable evening. Uh, so, with, you know, if, if, you're, if you're an Admirals fan, uh, God only knows where this one's going to go, but uh, it, it'll be fun, I, I guarantee you. Uh, well, if you we all seem up, to learn something. Yeah, Ian, if, you, if it's open to other people, happy to share it. You know, share Absolutely. the link. Absolutely. Uh, we're, we, last time we had 31 people joining us, which is uh, pretty pretty respectable. We've had a few more, and quite a few less in the past, so it just is increasing, and we love it. Uh, the more participation we get, some folks jump in with extra material, and some folks are there to look, learn, and ask questions. Yeah. Well, if you shoot an email, happy to put it on the website and let people know about it. Well, if, if, uh, again, if you hook my name to it, I've got the invitation list, so I just send out the invitations for for all of our guests, for all of yeah, our the, functions. The, the, hookup, the hookups links, uh, uh, Gar looks after that, and I just sit back and relax. <laughs> all right, well, we'll hook up and get those two topics out there. Yeah. yeah we're and, and, uh, just a sort of evidence that it does work. Last year... Uh, we added 13 new members to the West Toronto Club roster just because of our Zoom meetings. Uh, so it's it's rather rather interesting. And nobody from Toronto. They uh, we got Dawson Creek and Chilliwack, BC, and the Racine, Wisconsin, and New York, and uh, and me <laughs> and, and and Bob up in Barrie and, and Ken over in Hamilton and uh, Bur Burlington, Burlington, and Burlington. Yes, yeah, so. so uh, West uh, Toronto is expanding. We we got, you know, Toronto's the only club that's got a, members of salt water on both sides of the country. <laughs> now, I'm looking forward to Capex and seeing. Yeah, you know, I want to verify that everyone does wear pants because, you know, on Zoom you never see below the waist. So I'm looking forward to Capex. To see well, if you ask really nicely, Lassie, I might better kill. <laughs> Okay. I don't so know don't if, John, I don't know if John can stand that though. I'll have to have a sporing down the front now, won't I? 
You don't it's, want to see Ian in a kilt. No, <laughs> no. That's why that's, we that's why we banished him to Prince Edward County. That's right. The last person who saw me wearing a kilt was Governor General Roland Mitchner. And look what it did to him. He's dead. Yeah. Oh, I know. He it killed him. It killed him straight. <laughs> well, well, you, we do have fun in our club. We do have fun. He can take a line out of Victor Borga. Victor Borga is just this Mozart was only down to here. <laughs> so I guess we're like a bunch of Mozarts, aren't we? My son was married in Scotland, and all the guys had to wear kilts. That's right. I, I think that was the most comfortable garment I've ever worn, believe me. Except when the wind blows strongly off the, off the loch. Well, that depends on how hot it is outside, doesn't it? <laughs> oh my gosh i can't picture yeah you know, i mean i've seen the pictures but you know i, I don't know men in skirts no oh, high heels not, right not skirts no there's not skirts <laughs> they're too damn heavy to be skirts they, they weigh <laughs> they weigh a ton we have them in wales you know not only in scotland but we have welsh skirts as well if you go um, to parts of India, you will find some too. Yes, and the Irish do. ones, please. So the Irish in Ireland, oh yes. <laughs> okay, it's not, it's not a skirt; it's what's left of a blanket when you had to sell the rest. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear! And when I you attacked the bloody <laughs> English, you simply took it off because it got in the way and waved your sword louder. <laughs> Oh dear. Okay. So no kilts on stamps, right? <laughs> oh, there's <Okay>. a few. <laughs> well, actually, there there is a there's a Canadian stamp that shows a Scotsman in a kilt, uh, sowing the, the seeds in, in in the prairies, and I'm wondering what Scotsman was stupid enough to be out in mosquito country, you know, where the you know, the mosquitoes are the size of small airplanes. That's <laughs> Red River Settlement, if I remember. Yes, it is. Yeah. 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 Oh. <laughs> Dying breed. That's right. Digressed. Any more questions for Garfield? I mean, this has been a really enjoyable night. Thank you. Absolutely. I said good night about 10 minutes ago. I think I'll go now. Bye bye. Okay. <laughs> Thank Thanks, you for John. coming, John. Oh, oh. Hey, Giles. You were quiet today, Giles. Are you on mute? See if you could say hi. Oh. Oh, that's okay. Another great night. Thanks again for everybody. Well, thank you, Bob. We'll, we'll see you next no. meeting. We'll yeah, see you next thanks. meeting. For okay, sure. Bye bye. Great. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. All right. Cheers, Mike. Okay. Nice. All right, Garfield. I think we're we're done. Thank you again. This is fantastic. I hope you had fun. Because I, Joan, I enjoyed it immensely. And thanks for asking me. I really appreciate it.